Quantum Laser Pointers brings you the infamous double slit experiment right in the palm of your hand. In 1801, English physicist Thomas Young performed this experiment to determine if light was a particle or a wave. A laser shines a coherent beam of light through a film disc containing two parallel slits. Light striking the wall behind the slits produces a classic interference pattern. This surprising result means light passes through the parallel slits not as particles, but as waves. Visit our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Be among the first to see our new line of double slit lasers, quantumlaserpointers.com. First of all, I want to thank uh, everybody for accepting our invitation to come and uh, take part in this uh, event, which is very, I think, very important for me personally. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I kind of promised myself that the day will come and I will try to organize something like this, and I'm happy that the Wadim's parents and relatives are here. Uh, uh, I say a few words just today about Dima, who was a very, very close friend of mine. I kind of <coughs> spent the best uh, years of my life in close friendship with Dima, let's say from age 20 to age 26 or something. And I remember last time I discussed with him was uh, when uh, um, uh, Marina and Anya and uh, Dima came to St. Petersburg after their holiday in Estonia. And my son was born, and Dima drove us <laughs> from the hospital to home, and that was a very good time. I also had many interesting discussions during that August of 1987. And so I'm happy that uh, eventually this event takes place, and we can remember him. So my talk is uh, mostly, uh, I, I decided after Sasha Zamolochikov's talks, actually, one hour ago, that the my job will end up to explain why, why certain things he was mentioning uh, should be true and can be verified that they are true. Uh, so I will kind of build my talk in, in this spirit. Uh, first of all, um, I have to give some setup of, let's say, supersymmetry side. And uh, the guiding thing, uh, yeah, so the, what I am talking about is a collection of works I wrote uh, with Nikita Nekrasov, and also we wrote paper with Rosli that uh, um, Sasha mentioned, and then there was some paper I was Gerasimov, and then many other papers before. So eventually it ended up to a certain statement I, I will formulate. So the good way, good way to think uh, is to consider actually n equal two super young mill theories in d equals two. So in, in a sense, uh, uh, basically what we want to do, we want to look on any higher dimensional theory in a two-dimensional language. So for example, if theory is three-dimensional, we can think about it as uh, n equals two super young mills in d equals two with infinitely many uh, fields in a matter sector. So in general, these kind of theories, the way you think about this, you have a group, and you have a representation of this gauge group where the matter fields live, which in principle is not irreducible. So it's direct sum of some irreducible representations with some multiplicities, and this is where matter fields live. Now, what, when I said that the, I want to look on higher dimensional theories in two dimensional language, it means that, the, for example, if the theory is three dimensional, um, we would want to consider it on R2 times S1, and that is uh, on the S1 in the Fourier expansion, there are Kaluza Klein modes that would me make uh, this multiplicity space infinite dimensional, because for every Fourier mode you have, you have a field. So in that sense, uh, three-dimensional theory is two-dimensional theory with infinitely many colors of kind of fluids, and so on. 
But this is not the unique way. So Kaluza Klein is not only way. Uh, you can think about higher dimensional theory as two dimensional, and in a second I will say what are other ways. So as such, if there are enough supercharges and n equals two in four dim in two dimensions means that n equal two d equals two means four supercharges. So we may the claim that such theory uh, with four supercharges properly defined means that the these um, the fields in a matter sector are massive, so there is a mass cap, so they're massive, and masses are complex parameters in here. So in, in a good situation, which I don't want to specify explicitly what that means, you can integrate out all the massive modes in two dimensions. matter sector, which is massive. Also integrate out all non-abelian <coughs> components. Of the fields that you have uh, after left. So I, I explain what that means in a second. So if you have, let's say, uh, SU2, you have W plus and W minus. And in this setup, they are massive. Their masses are related to the um, complex color field in a supermultiplet. Let's call it sigma. And then you can integrate out uh, these guys. Actually, differences. Masses will be related to differences. So anyway, this is called abelianization. And I said it's doable in a proper, correct, way of thinking about things, so, and calculate what you can calculate. And only thing you can calculate is something what is called effective twisted superpotential, which is a function of uh, these uh, scalars uh, that I just mentioned. So it's a function of uh, scalars, and since I abelianize there, let's say for SUN, let's take S or UN, this will be function of n and other parameters, of course. So there is some notion of effective twisted superpotential, uh, uh, which comes with uh, four super theory in two dimensions with four supercharges. And the first example of such thing was by Dada, Divecchia, and Lusher in mid. Uh, 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 70s, I think it was 1975 or 1976, when they did the CPN model. So CPN model can be written as a gauge uh, theory, uh, gauge linear sigma model, and they calculated the W. Uh, so this is very old result. So in principle, so this is the exact. This can be calculated exactly. The reason is because it's one loop exact. Yeah. What was it? No, 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 for finite n. It's uh, one loop exact. It's, uh, it's a one loop exact. Um, this is a supersymmetric n equals to uh, CPN model. So basically what I just said means that if you have in two dimensions uh, four supercharges, and in a, in a kind of good setup, which I said that the, the, the matter sector is massive and do what I just said, the theory will comes with this object, which is effective twisted superpotential. Um, yeah. So now I want to talk about, on the other side, uh, on some integrable systems. Um, yeah, so let me say here also about the vacua. So, Vacua are actually basically critical points of this uh, twisted superpotential. I, I remind you that the superpotential is not yet a potential. You have to calculate potential from superpotential. There is some, some calculation you have to do. So the vacua are actually labeled by integers. Uh, 
and it's an integer set, let's say if it was un, then I will have n1 and n set of integers. And the reason for that is that the, th these integers are dual to the, f uh, to the fluxes of the abelian uh, um, field strengths. Uh, they, they are quantized. So I have, let's say if I have un, then I have n fluxes like that in, in two dimensions. So they are related to that. And eventually what is important is that the equation for vacua are given by this equation. Not equal to 0, but to this integer. In principle, you can take this now, move to the left-hand side, add a linear term to w. And so these are the vacuum equations. Um, yeah. Karepin's remark. Ice, one of these ice is square root of minus one. Uh, Karepin is very smart, yeah. He was my teacher, actually. This is square root of minus one. Uh, there are also, in uh, these kind of theories, uh, uh, in n equals two, in theories for supercharges, there are other things which are called chiral ring operators. These are very special operators. Um, if you wish, I can remind that if there are four supercharges, uh, let's call it q plus, q minus, q plus bar, q minus bar, you can construct some combination, let's say qa or qb, which are some linear combinations of this such that the Hamiltonian in this theory is anti-commutator of qa with qa dagger or with qb qv dagger, and supersymmetry algebra says that this is q squared to 0, qa or b squared to 0. So as you see, it's almost like a, a plus operator here written where if you think about q as a de derivation. So OR in cohomology of, let's say, qa. So if I want to find the ground state, h on psi equals 0 for such theory, which is the supersymmetric theory, so vacuum has zero energy, then it's the same as if I would calculate cohomology of q, and in the cohomology it will be harmonic representative, which will be the vacuum. So if I want to study the vacuum, I can map this question to these operators. Anyway, so good thing is that the expectation value of these operators can be calculated. And this is some, something we would be interested in. So let's call it O, let me call it E i of sigma. OK, so these are some numbers. The vacua are labeled, as I said, by the solution to this equation. So these are the things that we're interested in. Anyway, now let me move to the integrable system side. And what we made the claim was that um, um, these equations, which are the vacuum equations, uh, um, Valerja, you have questions? You can ask me. I know Sasha knows better answers, but I, I can try. Um, so this is, as I did, some equations, the vacuum equations. And uh, we claimed, at least let's say this way, I don't want to make a very strong statement. I would say like that, given, given your preferred integrable system, and here, let's say you want to do, let's say, xxx spin 1 half uh, Heisenberg spin chain, for example, or if you like xxc or something, um, it comes uh, with some beta equation. So this is solved with some beta ansatz. And we claim that there is a supersymmetric um, theory from the class I described above. So I have to give you a group, representations, the parameters, and so on. When this equation for that theory will coincide with a beta equation for this integrable system, for which all examples I know, there is a potential to this equation. 
and solution to the beta equation is labeled again by set of integers, where here now n would be related to the number of flipped spins or, or the particle sector, number of particles. Thinking about number of particles that spins up and down, how many spins you flip and so on. No. So this equation, uh, beta equation, can be written in terms of rapidities, and this has been written like that by people who are experts of this, again in this form. So claim was that we made that there are two things coincide. The first one, given such integrable system you like, so if you give me xxz or xyz or anything uh, I know, Hubbard model and so on, I can find the n equal to theory where this equation, where w effective of sigma will absolutely coincide with y, where identification is basically sigma equals lambda. And second, those uh, vacuum expectation values, which again are calculated as on the solutions of this equation, will be for this system energies of beta eigenstates. Now I call it lambda because sigma is same as lambda. Uh, and the third, the, the, the vacuum equation, equation for vacua, is the beta equation. Now, if you wish, you can call it experimental observation or whatever, whatever you like. But for example, for the xxx uh, spin one half, the theory on that side is a very well-known theory. It can give so I have to give a basically representation and identify parameters. Sim similarly for xxz. Now, uh, these are lattice models. I mean, xxx is a lattice model. One can ask question: What about other integrable system systems? Uh, I mean, already this statement is interesting. Actually, uh, let me make a remark that. If you want to consider XXZ model, let's say again spin one half, turns out that you have to take three dimensional super young mills on R2 times S1. And the radius of this S1 will be related to the, uh, uh, to the inhomogeneity here that we moved from XXX to XXZ. So if this equation, for example, were a rational one, this will become trigonometric, the beta equation. So this is just as, a, as an example I, I mentioned here. OK, so now I move to the other topic, which is, as I, May yes? And, uh, in terms of in the Heisenberg model, yeah. model, you have infinite number of commuting integrals. You, you know, in the, if you are restricted to the n-particle sector, you have n commuting n integrals. Commuting. Yeah. And what they correspond to? So the chiral, I forgot to say that probably, the um, chiral ring operators form the commutative ring. So if you remember, one to one, as I said, the O's are the same as E's after expectation value. As an operator's OI will be identified with HI. So the commutative ring of commuting Hamiltonians here is identified with the chiral ring. Uh, there are, of course, the examples where it's an infinite dimensional, like nonlinear Schrodinger model, right? In n-particle sector, nonlinear Schrodinger model is some integrable system also, which is called, I think, Young system. This is the famous one with delta function. And that has infinitely many Hamiltonians, and this can be mapped. Actually, that was the first example Greg Moore, Nikita, and I discovered in 1997. Yes? When you change the size of the spin shape, do you have to change the gate book? Okay, so this is a very good question. So what uh, Denis is asking, in a spin chain, I have here something which is the length of a spin chain, and another one which is number of flipped spins, right? So I said what was n, I did not say what was l. L enters in the representation in a gauge group. So if I want to get the L, so I have to take the L fundamental representations of UN, L, 
anti-fundamental representations of un and one a joint. And I have to give them masses. So let's say this is m of fundamental, this is m fundamental bar, and this is m a joint. And those guys will be related to impurities in each lattice point. So you, uh, okay. Do you have a way to take the large L limit? Well, I mean, the uh, question, good question would be how does this theory as a gauge theory looks like when representation is L goes to infinity? Very good question. I did not study it, but it's a good question. I, I moved to some other kind of questions. But, so what I'm claiming is you give me your beloved system, right? My job is to find the gauge theory. So, which means I have to find in which dimension is this gauge theory. It can be four dimensional, uh, Kaluza Klein compactified on two torus, for example. I have to find the dimensions. Then I have to find what gauge group I have to take. And as I, as I just seen, the gauge group was related in that example to, to the number of flipped things. I have to find it. And then I have to tell you which representation to take. And on top of that, I have to tell you what are the masses, and I have to map the masses to the parameters of integrable system. Believe me, every integrable system we know, this problem is solved. Okay, even in super algebra case and so on. Uh, for large scale. Yeah, so one more quick right. question. Uh, what is uh, the analog of Young Bach? The Young Bach situation. The very good question. Okay. So at the moment, it's more like coordinate beta ansatz, right? I give you the beta equations and Hamiltonians. What's analog of Young Bach's equation uh, it connects to the question how do I change number of particles, right? I mean, or as you see, uh, the gauge theory, actually, the gauge group is the number of particles. So the changing number of particles is changing the rank of the gauge group. Mm -hmm. So something should happen when uh, I can ask you, what is Youngian? What is UQSLN? And so on. All these are very good questions, but I don't want to cover this here. I mean, uh, let's say there are some very good mathematics works uh, done that, I mean, uh, commenting on what Sasha said, that not every statement was mathematically proven in uh, what he was using from our work. Uh, there is a paper by Mauli Kokokunko where they actually construct the R matrix from this. But there is no simple qualitative answer to this. Uh, uh, the domain wall, something. It, it's, I, I want to move to the discussion to the closer to that. OK, so um, where I was. Yeah, other type. Uh, yes, I wanted to move now to kind of to instantons, I think. What I, oh, no. I wanted to move to the other type of integrable systems. Valudia? <laughs> no, the, I, I want to answer his question. I am anxious, but he doesn't ask me. He asks Sasha. But do you have <laughs> some, any new integrable system in this? Every system that I describe here is some integrable system. Now, question is, yeah, new ones. I mean, the, I will give you the all commuting Hamiltonians, and I will give you a better equation. Now, question is whether you can recognize this integrable system or not. As I said, in vacuum sectors, this theory is integrable system. Now, question what you call quantum integrable system is that I give you um, as many commuting Hamiltonians as a dimension of the space, and I give you the energies for those. I mean, I, I can So this is a challenge question produce something unknown to fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. Impossible. <laughs> OK, now, uh, I, I would use uh, the way that Jim McNichnik would answer this question, but I don't think Valodia would like it. <laughs> we, we can, th there are some systems that I, I can produce, and I don't know what name to give to it, and so on. But OK, so now I want to move to the other type of integrable systems, which are called Hitchin systems. Well, and you might get lucky, he might not know Hitchin systems. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I did not discover Hitchin system this way. So the point is that the, I want to take the Zamolochikov's approach, that I know nothing. I'm just giving you something that you might uh, get excited. For calling that <laughs> That's what you said. That's what you said uh, yourself. <laughs> yourself, you said that. <laughs> Can I continue my talk? <laughs> okay, so Hitchin systems. Um, 
This will be related to the n equal to super young males in four dimensions. Uh, and this is very recent, uh, let's say, the person who probably formulated it generality was Gaiota. And what? Oh, two teeth. Yeah. So it's about two years ago, let's say, 2009. Sorry, sorry. It was definitely 2011, but it's not two years ago. So Hitchin did this. Uh, let's consider Riemann surface of genus G and N punctures. Uh, let's pick a group G. So for, for my discussion, it's UN, or most likely I will consider SU2, basically, so to be simple. So Riemann surface, group G, and then we consider gauge field, A, and the one form, phi. So this is in a joint representation, uh, and gauge field is whatever it is, and then he wrote the equations, which are called Hitchin equations, so we can calculate curvature of this connection A, and write this is equal phi z, phi z bar. For some reason he called it Higgs, and this is goes under name of Higgs bundle. And there are two other equations. That's the nabla z of a phi z bar equals zero, and the complex conjugate nabla z bar a phi z equals zero. Now, uh, there are here in the room there are people who invented instanton. So this is actually the dimensional reduction of the instanton in four dimensions. With a certain twist when uh, A3 and A4 are called phi z and phi z bar. It's, um, yeah. Okay, so these are the equations and we have to divide it by the gauge transformations. So this is a finite dimensional space. Sasha, finite dimensional space. And uh, so if it's SU2, the dimension of this space is 2 times 3G minus 3 plus N for SU2. OK, um, now I want to a little bit make situation Clearer, uh, I can consider another space. Just immediately, I want to consider another space, which will be like this. I can consider another set of equations when f of a plus i phi, which is now this is complexified connection. This will be as so it was as SU, SU2. This is SL2C equals zero. This equation is a complex flat connection on the same Riemann surface and so on, and it has complex gauge transformations. I can consider gauge transformations to be complexified from the previous one, so I have to divide by complex transformations, gauge transformations. So this is another space. Now, if you look on these equations, you will re immediately recognize that if you take real part of this equation, you get the equation which you cannot see, let me. Re real part of this equation is first of Hitchin equations. F the z bar equals commutator. And the imaginary part of this equation is a, a, a second equation plus third equation. So what is missing is their difference, right? Or maybe other way around. Maybe it's a difference and the uh, sum is missing. Uh, but that space is divided by unitary gauge transformation, then this is divided by complex gauge transfer. Obviously, I can gauge fix here to have only unitary gauge symmetry left, so I can gauge fix the complex direction, and then I will get the other equation. So the missing equation there is a gauge fixing equation here. So these two spaces are isomorphic. So this is, these are same spaces as the spaces. But the important thing is that in that picture, let's call it picture one, first picture, 
Hitchin produced commuting Hamiltonians, so functions on Z space. Yeah, first of all, uh, Z space is uh, symplectic, and actually, it is hyperkeller. So that that space is a hyperkeller manifold. And basically, it comes thus. It comes with the three symplectic forms. Let's call it uh, omega holomorphic symplectic forms. Uh, let me take first one. Let's call it a z and phi z bar to be. These are half of variables. There. Let's call them holomorphic ones. And the a z bar and phi z will be anti-holomorphic. And then one can write the symplectic form delta a z wedge delta phi z bar trace. And this will be holomorphic symplectic form on that manifold, because I'm not using the complex conjugates of these guys. Or I can call holomorphic variables AC, actually. Let's call it AC, which is A plus I phi. This one, I'm not using the subscript Z or Z bar. This is completely independent what uh, complex structure I choose. Here, of course, I choose the complex structure, because I say what is Z and what is Z bar. And there is another holomorphic symplectic form here I can write, which is integral of trace delta AC, which delta AC. I'm not using AC bars. It's just holomorphic again. And there is a third holomo uh, holomorphic structure, and the symplectic form there also. So obviously, this one is independent on the choice of complex structure on sigma. So this is probably topological. This one depends on complex structure. So we will work now with, uh, let's call it i, and let's call this j. So we will work in isymplectic structure. And Hitchin claimed that this is an integrable system producing the commuting Hamiltonians. And now I will take the case of SL2. Well, I have that thing SL2C here. So take a Beltrami differentials on uh, sigma on uh, sigma. Now, how many they are? There are exactly 3g minus 3 plus n mu i's and multiply by trace phi z bar square. Now, let's see what it is. This is a 0, 2, right? And this is 1 minus 1 differential. So total, this is 1, 1 form. We are integrating over sigma. And it's obviously the H is commute, because I use phi z bar, and the phi z bar, Poisson commutes with phi z bar, and I don't use A. So these are exactly as many Poisson commuting Hamiltonians as a half dimension of the space. Right? So he produced the integrable classical integrable system. Examples. I, I, I emphasize this classical integrable system is in iholomorphic structure here. This, as a space, this set space is the same as that space, as I said. But these Hamiltonians are, make sense in this picture. OK, examples. Consider uh, g equals 0 and n punctures. So now, Valudia would ask Hitchin, so did he invent a new integrable system, or this is something we already know? The answer is, this is something we already know. And this is called Gaden. Okay, so this particular example, n punctures on, uh, of course, the positions of punctures will be related to the coupling constants in Gaden and so on. Second example, take g equals 1, n equals 1, but take gauge group to be un. Okay, So he wrote the Hamiltonian not only for SL2, but for un also. So this is uh, also known integrable system. This is elliptic Calogero 
other, and so on. So the, you specify number of punctures, you specify the group, you specify uh, uh, genus, and you get some integrable system. So now I want to go back to Gaiotto, particularly, which disappeared from my blackboard. And make a statement, which is modernization of the statement made um, very quickly after Zeiberg Witten's work by um, Gorsky, Krichiver, Mironov, Marshakov, and Morozov, uh, uh, Warner and Martin, Martinik and Warner, and uh, Donaghi and Witten, and then eventually ended up like this. For every each an integrable system there is n equals 2 super young mills in four dimension where geometry of vacua or you wish uh, I mean, what's called zeiberg witten prepotential and so on, um, is described by this uh, classical integrable system. Now, the identification here, the best way to think about this is following. So if you have classical algebraic integrable system, you automatically have something called the prepotential. So let me describe in very, very quickly what that means. If classically you have a classical algebraic integrable system, you have a complex 2 n dimensional manifold with whole, no, nowhere degenerated holomorphic to zero form, and its projection to the base, which is uh, sitting in Cn, with the Poisson commuting Hamiltonians with respect to this symplectic form. And there is some restriction on the fibers. Basically, fibers should be complex tori. And one can ask how to write the uh, action variables on the base and uh, the angle variables on the fiber. So normally, if it would be real case, like something which we study in a classical mechanics course, so if this will be real to n dimensional, and if fibers are compact, then there is a theorem which says that it's torus. Fibers are tori. And the way we write the um, um, action angle variables is like this. Uh, around the fibers, omega is exact, so let's write it as a d of some one form. Okay? Then we can integrate one form over the cycles uh, in the fiber and get something uh, which uh, are coordinates on the base, because we integrate it out in the fibers, we get something on the base. And it's easy to show that symplectic form omega will be dei wedge d phi i, where phi i's are coordinates in a fiber. Okay? This is a way to construct action angle variables. Now let's do the complex case. So in a complex case, as I said, fibers are tori. So <coughs> we have, and they have the polarized abelian varieties. There is some restrictions there. So we have two types of cycles on a fiber, A cycles and B cycles. So if we take theta, and integrate over A cycles, we get some variables, let's call it AI. And if we take theta, which is defined over there, over B cycles, we get another variable, so let's call it AI dual. And these cycles, of course, are normalized and both A's and A duals are coordinates here, but there are n of them and n of them. So they must be dependent on each other. They have to be related. And the simple statement is that they are related with some potential. So AI dual is equal to some holomorphic, meromorphic function f of a, the AI. So this is, again, very easy to check. OK. So every such integrable system comes with prepotential. So these Hitchin systems that I had there has some prepotential, let's call it f of Hitchin. Which one I erase? <coughs> uh, 
<coughs> so we have prepotential in Hitch. Of course, it's always kind of not very uniquely defined because th they are defined uh, up to action of some discrete groups because I can have uh, some monodromy. Uh, I, I want to explain concept. So we have F for a Hitchin integrable system because Hitchin integrable system is example of classical algebraic integrable system. And we have F in n equal to super young mills which goes under zyberg witten prepotential. So claim is basically they are the same. And there are, of course, identifications. You have to say well, which Hitchin system correspond to which super young mill theory. And that's a separate story. OK. So now, let's construct two-dimensional theory two-dimensional effective theory out of these four-dimensional super young mills. I told you that one easy way to get two-dimensional effective super young mill theory out of four-dimensional is to compactify on two tors. Not dimensionally reduce, but I mean compactify. Include all kaluza klein modes, sum over them, and so on. Right? And I said that does it matter in what representation you leave I erase it. Doesn't matter what representation you leave, it's finite dimensional, infinite dimensional, there is a notion of effective, twist, effective twisted superpotential. So now, but I, but I know that using that method, it's not straightforward actually to identify uh, this relation, to improve this relation a little bit. So what we do is different. So now we remember instanton counting. And here I want to mention Dima Knižnik, actually. That time when he was in August 1987, Dima was doing two things. One thing was which become later KPZ. And if you remember, uh, he had the formulas, said notes, and anyway. So that was one thing, and he was constantly talking about that. And I was working with Alexev on similar thing from the geometric point of view, from the representation theory point of view. So this was a good thing. Another thing, he had a dream to explain that there is a version of belavin knižnik holomorphic factorization for the gauge theories as a factorization in a moduli space of instantons. So he said he was thinking that if you have integral or moduli space of instantons, this is some quaternionic space, there has to be some holomorphic structure, and whatever in good theory, it has to be an integral over moduli square of holomorphic function on the quaternions. And, uh, and, and he passed away three months later. Uh, in mid-90s, I start thinking about this again, and um, some things happened, not exactly the way Zima wanted. <laughs> but I should say that the Pestel's work does contain some holomorphic factorization as an integral over Coulomb moduli, uh, but it's not holomorphic factorization in moduli space of instantons. So it's a moduli square of the uh, partition function of super young mills in omega background with some simple factor, but an integral is over Coulomb moduli. So the, so, so Dima had some intuition which at least drove me to the question of studying integrals or moduli space of instantons, and I want to say a few words about this. So um, as um, um, Sasha mentioned there is this partition function, instanton partition function, which can be written as uh, taught by Sasha Polyakov and uh, others, Belavin and so on, as a sum of something, some integrals over moduli space of instanton, where Q is exponential of I tau, and tau is uh, one of our coupling constant in gauge theory, and if there is a theta term plus theta. So there is some object like this, and some of q to the power and so on. And then you have to know what to integrate, and it depends very much on the theory, and so on. But these integrals diverge, because moduli space of instanton, instantons is non-compact space. I mean, this momentarily you start computing those integrals, they diverge. So those integrals can be regularized 
And uh, in order to regularize that and preserving the maximal symmetry and so on, you have to, you have to remember that the Lorentz group there is SO4, which is SE2 times, in Euclidean space, S2 times SE2. And you can break the Lorentz group by preserving here one factor and here one factor. So basically what you do, this, uh, this is, uh, you have to think about R2 times R2, your R4, and make the integrals or moduli space. So Vincent are not invariant, but equivariant, where for each abelian subgroup, you identify equivalent parameter epsilon, epsilon 2, which are complex parameters. And that's what Nikita called omega background. Because this theory now does not have a Lorentz symmetry. You break it by making and so on. So these formulas are known. In principle, after you think this way, you can, you can write the formulas, identify fields, and that what we were working in middle 90s with Greg Moore. And eventually, <coughs> when you complete this theory with a classical part and one loop part, uh, you get the partition function, which will depend now on these two epsilons, and will depend on Coulomb moduli, because we integrate out every single, and other parameters of this theory. Now, <clears throat> when you have two epsilons, when you turn on two epsilons, theory actually effectively is zero dimensional. Epsilon one not equal to zero, epsilon two not equal to zero, Seor is effectively zero dimensional. But if one of epsilon is equal to zero, let's say epsilon two equal to zero, you still preserve a super Poincare group in one of those, uh, uh, let's say, R2s. Seor here will have a super Poincare invariant. You did not break that one. It's easy to show, and on this one, the, I mean, for two epsilons, uh, Nikita's work devoted in 2002, it's easy to show that uh, the, the now applying it to this uh, case of epsilon 2 equal to 0, it is easy to show that we will fit in a model which I had written here. So this theory will be now two dimensional with infinitely many massive fields. So omega background, this is a claim now, omega background for epsilon 2 equal to 0 is effectively two-dimensional super young Mills from the class I described in the beginning, from the class of, let's say, beginning of this talk. The now only question is remaining, can we actually say something uh, about uh, uh, the effective twisted superpotential of this theory? Because I said this is in the class of the beginning, so the theories in the beginning had effective twisted superpotentials. Question is, can we say something about that effective twisted superpotential? So we can say two things actually immediately without much trouble. First one, if I take limit epsilon 1 goes to 0, epsilon 2 goes to 0, of epsilon 1 times epsilon 2 log v, as Nikita proved, this will be zyberg witten prepotential uh, for that theory that we are talking about. So I have to start with some n equal 2 theory, as I said. For every Hitchin system, there is some n equal to super young Mills. I start with that. I put epsilon and epsilon 2. I multiply this depends on, so this is the statement. Second thing is, now let's consider limit epsilon 2 goes to 0, epsilon 2 log z, and call this w uh, remaining epsilon, epsilon 1 equals epsilon, and all the a's and other parameters I can have. So this is some function. And claim is that this is effective twisted superpotential for that, let's say, unknown two-dimensional super young Mills, which we get 
with this alternative way, alternative to Kaluza-Klein way of producing two-dimensional theory out of four-dimensional theory. Now, this guy, from if you look on a previous formula, and now Sasha will start arguing, maybe. Uh, this guy has a property that it has a, a, as a residue of the uh, single pole, cyborg written prepotential. Because if you look the way I described it, it has to be like that. And then there are corrections. The, what? It is a, a, after multiplication. Right. right. If you multiply, you have to take log, right? Log I call w. If you multiply this by epsilon 1 and take the limit, you will get here. Is this clear? So now, this one depends on one epsilon, remaining epsilon, right? So let's multiply by that epsilon this w effective. And take limit epsilon goes to 0. This is the same as limit epsilon 1 goes to 0, epsilon 2 goes to 0 of epsilon 1 times epsilon 2 log z. Okay, so this has to be f. So now assuming that it has expansion in Laurent series, then the first term will be finite and then will be O of epsilon and so on. Okay, <clears throat> now let's now look what are these equations in current setup. So this, this is very motivational, what I'm saying. It, of course, everything has been, has been checked and proved and so on. So W effective DAI will be, in this case, 1 over epsilon DF DA plus corrections. And this, our formula says, has to be 2 pi square root of minus 1 integers. So the vacuo in this n equal to super young mills that I produce with the alternative way of d reducing to two dimensions, alternative to Kaluza Klein, in the lowest order have a form df dai equals 2 pi square root of minus 1 epsilon times ni. Right? And then the corrections. I just took this epsilon to the right hand side, so I get df dai equals 2 pi. So this is like bohr sommerfeld approximation if we, will, if we think about quantizing our classical integrable system, right? So it hints that the now way we should think is that this remaining epsilon actually is a Planck constant. Right, so uh, let, let me say a few words about this. So about this instant on partition function, lots of things are known right now. So there was a formula we wrote long ago with Greg Moore for particular cases and then with Losev as an integrals. Then there is a formula combinatorial that Nikita defined it uh, in terms of partitions. Then there, is, uh, the, there are theorems that th this actually can be summed up and there is a radius of convergence for this and there are lots of good theorems about this. So this object is well known. What I'm saying, I'm assuming now that everything is good there, and I want to now utilize it in this problem. So let's not discuss whether that thing is good or not. It is good. They like said there are integral formulas, there are formulas, combinatorial formulas, there are exact formulas, and there are many, many things about that. Okay, so now what I want you to say. Yeah. Um, so there is a hint now that epsilon should be considered as h bar, complexified. This is a hint from, from this formula. The w effective twilda, epsilon, a, and so on, should be considered as Yang-Yang function for quantized Hitchin system. As I said, for, for these uh, situations when we have a beta ansatz and so on, there is always a potential to beta equations. So, and then, of course, the derivatives of W effective with respect to some proper parameters should be this chiral ring operator. So there is entire machinery that can one continue, right? 
So now we come to the point where uh, the, what we want to do is uh, clear to us, and now we have to prove that this is correct. <laughs> Um, so the claim now is quantized Hitchin, which means the spectrum of commuting of Hitchin Hamiltonians quantized. are given by expectation values of O's in whatever I said there, epsilon 2 equals 0, epsilon 1 equals epsilon, n equal 2 super young mills in 4D. So now I take n equal four super young mil, n equals two super young mils in 4D. I know explicit procedure how to construct this W effective. As I said, we believe that everything there is right. And then I claim only thing is remaining to check that energies I get and a beta equation I get are correct quantization of Hitchin system, which is in correct Hilbert space. And this has been checked explicitly for many examples, including. Sphere with n marked points, which is Godin. Uh, torus with one marked point, which is elliptic Calogero Moser. Moser. Then there are its relativistic versions. And there are its quivers, quiver gauge groups, and many examples. What I mean explicit check. I mean, honest to be honest, what explicit check means that these integrals, well, I erased it. So check means that I can always consider the uh, expansion of uh, answers in, uh, for energies in integrable system in terms of this parameter Q, which I identify with the gauge theory, and I can check term by term. And they coincide to very large order. So my time is up, and thank you very much. There were questions during the talk, so just one question. <coughs> you seem to have no, on, on the integrable system side, you seem to have no trace of the fermions, the fermions of the super. No, these fermions are gone. So integrable systems, if I want to have fermions in integrable system, then my gauge theory will be very, very fermionic, whatever. But uh, there are no fermions in integrable systems. There, there are, yes, that's right. So but the, 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 the fermions are in some sense lost. Right. Well, you see, the it, it, Werner Nam likes to say that now I finally understand why there are these integrable systems, because they are basically vacuum sector of supersymmetric systems, and those I understand. What? Maybe you'd better say, now I understand why they are supersymmetric systems. That would be your statement. Uh, so Werner doesn't understand integrable one, but understands supersymmetric one. And you understand the supersymmetric Yeah, yeah, you already said, I understand nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, you said it, and I just quoted you. <laughs> but I know I'm not allowed to quote a person when he makes claim about himself. <laughs>
I have to give some setup of, let's say, supersymmetry side. And the, the guiding thing, uh, yeah, so the, what I am talking about is a collection of works I wrote uh, with Nikita Nekrasov, and also we wrote paper with Rosli that uh, um, Sasha mentioned, and then there was some paper I wrote with Gerasimov, and then many other papers before. So eventually it ended up to a certain statement I, I will formulate. So the good way, good way to think uh, is to consider actually n equal two super young mill theories in d equals two. So in, in a sense, uh, uh, basically what we want to do, we want to look on any higher dimensional theory in a two-dimensional language. So for example, if theory is three-dimensional, we can think about it as uh, n equals two super young mills in d equals two with infinitely many uh, fields in a matter sector. So in general, these kind of theories, where you think about this, you have a group, and you have a representation of this gauge group, where the matter fields live, which in principle is not irreducible. So it's direct sum of some irreducible representations with some multiplicities, and this is where matter fields live. So Basically, what I just said means that if you have in two dimensions uh, four supercharges, and in a, in a kind of good setup, which I said that the, the, the matter sector is massive and do what I just said, the theory will comes with this object, which is effective to its superpotential. Um, yeah. So now I want to talk about, on the other side, uh, on some integrable systems. Um, yeah, so let me say here also about the vacua. So vacua are actually basically critical points of this uh, twisted superpotential. I, I remind you that the superpotential is not yet a potential. You have to calculate potential from superpotential. There is some, some calculation you have to do. So the vacua are actually labeled by integers. And it's an integer set, let's say, if it was un, then I will have n1 and n set of integers. And the reason for that is that the, th these integers are dual to the, f uh, to the fluxes of the abelian uh, um, field strengths, uh, they, they are quantized. So I have, let's say, if I have un, then I have n fluxes like that in, in two dimensions. So they're related to that. And, and eventually, what is important is that the equation for vacua are given by this equation. Not equal to 0, but to this integer. In principle, you can take this now, move to the left-hand side, add a linear term to w, and so these are the vacuum equations. Um, Karekin's remark. Yeah. Karekin's remark. Ice, one of these ice is square root of minus one. Uh, Karepin is very smart, yeah. He was my teacher, actually. And in this setup, they are massive. Their masses are related to the um, complex color field in a supermultiplet. Let's call it sigma. And then you can integrate out uh, these guys. Actually, differences, masses will be related to differences. So anyway, this is called abelianization. And I said it's doable in a proper, correct way of thinking about things. So, and calculate what you can calculate. And only thing you can calculate is something what is called effective twisted superpotential, which is a function of uh, these uh, scalars uh, that I just mentioned. So it's a function of uh, scalars. And since I abelianize there, let's say for SUN, let's take S or UN, this will be function of N and other parameters, of course. 
So there is some notion of effective twisted superpotential, uh, uh, which comes with uh, four super, sorry, in two dimensions with four supercharges. And the first example of such thing was by Dada, Divecchia, and Lusher in mid uh, uh, 70s, I think it was 1975 or 1976, when they did the CPN model. So CPN model can be written as a gauge uh, theory, uh, gauge linear sigma model, and they calculated the W. Uh, so this is very old result. So in principle, so this is the exact. This can be calculated exactly. The reason is because it's one loop exact, yeah. What was it? No, 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 for finite turn. It's uh, one loop exact. It's, uh, it's a one loop exact. Um, this is a supersymmetric n equals to uh, CPN model. Quantum laser pointers brings you the infamous double slit experiment right in the palm of your hand. In 1801, English physicist Thomas Young performed this experiment to determine if light was a particle or a wave. A laser shines a coherent beam of light through a film disc containing two parallel slits. Light striking the wall behind the slits produces a classic interference pattern. This surprising result means light passes through the parallel slits not as particles, but as waves. Visit our website or subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Be among the first to see our new line of double slit lasers, quantumlaserpointers.com. I want to thank uh, everybody for accepting our invitation to come and uh, take part in this uh, event, which is very, I think, very important for me personally. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, I kind of promised myself that the day will come and I will try to organize something like this, and I'm happy that the Wadim's parents and relatives are here. Uh, uh, I say a few words just today about Dima, who was a very, very close friend of mine. I kind of <coughs> spent the best uh, years of my life in close friendship with Dima, let's say from age 20 to age 26 or something. And I remember last time I discussed with him was uh, when uh, um, uh, Marina and Anya and uh, Dima came to St. Petersburg after their holiday in Estonia. And my son was born, and Dima drove us <laughs> from the hospital to home, and uh, it was a very good time I also had. Now, what, when I said that the, I want to look on higher dimensional theories in two dimensional language, it means that, the, for example, if the theory is three dimensional, um, we would want to consider it on R2 times S1, and that is uh, on the S1 in the Fourier expansion, there are Kaluza Klein modes that would me make uh, this multiplicity space infinite dimensional, because for every Fourier mode, you have, you have a field. So in that sense, uh, three-dimensional theory is two-dimensional theory with infinitely many Kaluza Klein fluids, and so on. But this is not uh, the unique way. So Kaluza Klein is not only way uh, you can think about higher dimensional theory as two-dimensional, and in a second I will say, what are other ways? So as such, if there are enough supercharges and n equals 2 in, four dim in two dimensions means that n equals 2 d equals 2 means four supercharges. So we made the claim that such theory uh, with four supercharges properly defined means that the, this um, uh, the fields in a matter sector are massive, so there is a mass gap, so they're massive, and masses are complex parameters in here. So in, in a good situation, which I don't want to specify explicitly what that means, you can integrate out all the massive modes in two dimensions.
measure sector, which is massive, also integrate out all non-abelian <coughs> components. of the fields that you have uh, after left. So I, I explain what that means in a second. So if you have, let's say, uh, SU2, you have W plus and W minus, 